Today in the workshop, we're going to be assembling a little robot car base, and we'll learn how to use those speed encoder disks that come with these kits. We'll also learn about using interrupts with the Arduino. So there's plenty to do today, so let's get started. Welcome to the workshop. Hello and welcome to the workshop. Today we're going to be working with a small robot car base. Now if you've been into robotics for any period of time, I'm sure you've seen these things advertised on eBay and Amazon. They're very inexpensive little bases that are available in both two-wheel and four-wheel configuration, and they're really great to get started with robotics with. Now I've got two of these bases over here to show you. First of all, this one over here. This kit cost me about $15, and it comes with everything, the wheels, the base itself, the battery holder, the motors, a cap all the different parts and this one even threw in a little screwdriver which I thought was pretty cute another one that I got uh, for even less money I picked this up at one of my local electronic stores for all of twelve dollars and ninety eight cents uh, this one here has all the parts the other one had it even has a mount for a servo motor and uh, and a sensor so that it's got the uh, the pan and tilt mechanism uh, is included with this as well too so amazing values for the money one part that's included with both of them that nobody seems to tell you what to do with however is this and this is a little sensor that you place on the wheel in order to measure the rotation of the wheel you can measure the speed and by doing that you can measure distance the amount the wheel is turned and get a lot of useful information but as i said there aren't very many instructions for using it well, I intend to change that today, so what we're going to do is put together a robot car base. The reason I've got two of them here is that there's two different styles of motor mount, so I want to show you how the motor goes on to that. And then we're going to add a few extra components onto that so that we can experiment with this speed sensor, and I can show you how it actually works. Now, the components we're going to add are as follows. We're going to add an Arduino Uno, and that's going to be the microcontroller that's the brains of the projects, an L. 298N motor driver, and we've seen this, it's a dual H-bridge controller, and it's going to, of course, drive the two DC motors. And this device here, which is an optical source sensor, which is meant to be used with the little wheel that I just showed you, in order to measure rotation. So there's a lot to do today, so let's get ready and build ourselves a little robot car. So let's take a look at some of the parts that you get in one of these little robot car base kits. Now, I've got them laid out on the table over here. Now, this is the base itself, and as you can see, the base has been drilled with a number of holes, plus it has some cutouts over here, and I'll show you what those are for in a few moments. Then we've obviously got some wheels. Uh, these are pretty standard little wheels. It's cute. They actually have sort of rubberized tires on them, so they work well on both carpet, linoleum, whatever you happen to drive over. You can even use them outdoors to some degree. A battery holder. Now this uses a four cell battery holder, although I actually tend to replace these with five cell holders, and that's because the motor driver I'm using, the um, the H-bridge, is going to drop 1.4 volts, and I want to give the full six volts to my motors, so by having seven and a half volts instead of six, I can allow for that voltage drop, but you can use the four cell holder that comes with this if you wish. Uh, here's a rear caster that is used to balance the uh, the base because we've only got two wheels. Um, these two blocks are used as part of the motor mount and that's the difference between this and the other kit. The other kit uses plexiglass for this and I'll show you how both of them work. Uh, we've obviously got all the nuts and bolts that we need. These are the sensor discs that I was talking about earlier. These will be used to sense the motor speed and I'll show you how we can wire for those. Speaking of wires, these guys were nice enough to give me uh, some wires to solder to my motor. Not all the kits come with these, but this one does. And of course the motors themselves. These are little 6 volt motors that actually have quite a bit of torque. So now that we've seen all of the parts, the next thing we want to do is plan out how we're going to lay our components onto our robot car base. 
Now, when you're planning out the design of your robot car, there's a number of things you need to take into consideration. After all, you've only got a small area on the base in which to place your components. There are things that obviously you can't move, such as the motors and the wheels and the rear caster. You also need to consider balance. You can't place all of your components on one side of the robot because it might tilt over. But if you get creative, you can place quite a few parts onto one of these robot bases. I've got an example over here to show you. Now this is a experimenter's robot that I've been working on here in the workshop and I'll be showing you how to build something similar to this in a future video and as you can see it's got quite a few components including components on the underneath of it and that's actually one of the keys in getting all of the components onto the robot. By doing that, you can place quite a few parts onto one of these robot designs and have a fairly stable design that isn't going to tilt over. So now that you've seen the extreme, let's just see what we can do with the robot base that we have right now. Now on our robot base, I've right now mounted one of the motors just to illustrate where it goes. I've left the brown paper on the base intentionally because I can use that to mark off where I'm going to drill any additional mounting holes. So on our base, we're going to end up with another motor over here and a caster. And I'm going to place my motor driver on the bottom over here as well. I'm going to place it up here. I know that there's going to be enough clearance with the wheels in order for the heat sink not to scrape on the ground and the wires from the motor driver can go through this hole so I can pass them through to the Arduino. Another thing I'm going to mount on the bottom is a small 9 volt battery and again I can pass its wires through here. Now this will be used to power the Arduino. It's not the most ideal way of powering the Arduino but again for our simple robot it'll certainly suffice. So now we're going to flip it over and see what we can place on this side of the robot. Now I need my speed sensors. The wheels which will go over here are what I'm going to be sensing and I've got two different styles of these sensors here to show you. Now these just snap in into these little openings over here or you can place them going the other direction whatever makes you happy. Once you do place these in though you're going to want to actually mount them permanently. Now I can't put a hole over here because it's going to go underneath the motor but I can certainly put one over here so I'll make a mark on my cardboard and that way I know that I need to drill a hole over here. Now the other components I'm going to use, this is the front of my robot, this is the rear. On the rear I'm going to place my battery holder. Now as I said I'm using a five cell holder and I'm going to place the holder over here so that uh, it's at the back and there'll be some weight over there. I'm going to counter that weight with the Arduino which I'm going to place at the front over here and I'm also going to throw a small little solderless breadboard onto the mix and the reason is it's just going to simplify my wiring. So now that I know roughly where all of my parts are going to be I'm going to fine-tune that and then I'm going to drill holes in the base in order to mount these things. Once I determined the final position of my components, I made marks on the paper and took everything over to my drill press. I mounted the acrylic base onto a piece of wood to avoid cracking it while I was drilling it. Of course, you could use a handheld drill and it would work just fine. When everything was drilled, I removed the paper to leave a clear acrylic base. The next step was to install the rear caster using the four mounting screws provided by the kit. On the opposite side of the caster, I installed my battery holder. Next, I put spacers in for the L298N and the Arduino. After that, I soldered up the motors. I then mounted the motors on the base. On this particular base, this requires two aluminum blocks, which are provided with the kit. The next step was to put the encoder discs onto the motor shaft and to put the sensors onto the opposite side of the base. Once I aligned everything correctly, I used a couple of dabs of hot glue to fasten the encoders in place. I decided it would be a good idea to test the motors with my 6 volt battery just to make sure everything was working and that the encoder discs weren't binding on the sensors. The next step was to mount the L298N H-bridge controller on the bottom of the base. After that, I mounted the Arduino on the opposing side. 
I placed a small solderless breadboard on the top of the base beside the battery holder. And finally, I installed the wheels. And my robot car base is complete. So now that we've put together our little car base, I want to discuss this small disc that comes with every car. Now this is the key to sensing the wheel rotation. Now you'll notice the disc has a series of slots in it. This particular disc has 20 slots, although the actual number doesn't really matter. The disc is meant to be used with a component called an opto-interrupter, and I've got one over here on the workbench. An opto-interrupter is simply an LED and a phototransistor mounted with a gap in between, and so it can sense when something is passed in the gap. And in operation, the disc is inserted in this particular gap, and as it rotates, it will interrupt the light beam. Now, the way that this works is that as the light beam is interrupted, the phototransistor will sense and not sense the light, and this will produce a series of pulses. If the disc is rotated faster, the pulses will come faster, and we can use this to measure disc rotation and speed. So I've got a little demonstration hooked up here on the workbench to show you how this all works. So let's go take a look at that right now. Now for this demonstration, I've placed the motor on the base and the encoder wheel on the motor. I've placed the sensor in the proper position, and I'm powering the sensor with the 5 volts from my workbench power supply. I'm using a 6-volt battery to power the motor. Now, in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to use a device called a logic probe. If you're not familiar with logic probes, they're very simple devices. What they do is they can measure whether a signal is at a digital 0, a digital 1, or whether it's alternating between it, in other words, whether it's pulsing. So, for example, if I touch the ground lead right now, the green light comes on, and I get a sound that indicates that I'm at a digital zero. If I touch the 5 volt lead, I get my red light, and a different sound that indicates that I'm at a digital one. Now, if I touch the output right now, it's sitting at a digital zero. But let's connect the motor now. Now the motor's spinning and we'll measure the output. And as you can see from the flashing yellow light, I'm getting a pulse from the output. This is the pulse that's being produced as the sensor disk spins in between the optical interrupter. And when I remove it, the output right now is high. The output in a stationary position simply depends on where the wheel came to rest. Now, the observant ones among you will have noticed that in my last experiment, I didn't just use an opto-interrupter. Instead, I had a small circuit board that had an opto-interrupter on it, and it has another component on it as well. Now, here I've got an opto-isolator by itself, along with two different boards that have an opto-isolator and some other electronic components. The primary component is something called an LM393 dual comparator chip. And for that reason, these sensors are sometimes referred to as LM393 sensors, although that's a bit of a misnomer. Now, a comparator is an analog chip. It's actually another form of another analog chip called an operational amplifier, or op-amp. And it can be used for a number of things, including interfacing analog signals to digital signals. Now, unlike an analog to digital converter, a comparator only outputs one bit. The way a comparator works is as follows. A comparator has two inputs, the actual input signal and a reference voltage. The reference voltage is compared to the input signal. If the input signal is lower than the reference voltage, then the comparator will output a digital zero. If the signal goes higher than the reference voltage, it'll output a digital one. In this fashion, a comparator can be used to clean up a messy analog signal and produce a nice pulse, which is exactly what we want for our speed sensor. Okay, now that we've seen how our sensor works, it's time to hook it up to an Arduino and see how we can read those pulses to determine the rotation rate of our wheel. But before we do this, there's an important computer concept that we need to discuss. Okay, I apologize, that was pretty silly, but it actually does illustrate a point. What happened to me there 
was I was interrupted. And it's time for us to talk about interrupts. Now, interrupts are a very important programming concept. If you don't know about them, well, it's time to learn about them because they are used in quite a few programs, not just for the Arduino, but for all types of computers. In fact, if you're using a desktop computer to watch this video, and according to my analytics, most of you do, you're using interrupts all the time. You're using them when you move your mouse. You're using them when you type on your keyboard. If you're watching on a phone or a tablet, you're also using interrupts every time you you swipe your screen or press something on the screen, you're causing an interrupt. Now here is how interrupts work. Now a standard Arduino sketch runs as follows. After setting up a number of items, we go into a loop and inside the loop we do stuff. And we continue to do stuff until the Arduino is powered down or reset. Now in a case of an interrupt, the program starts the same way. We set up some items and we go into the loop. And we do stuff and continue to do stuff as the loop runs. However, if an interrupt is generated, we branch off and run a special piece of code called an interrupt service routine. Once we're done with that code, we go back into the loop and continue to do stuff until another interrupt is generated. Now the Arduino supports hardware interrupts. Some processors support software interrupts, but the Arduino isn't one of them. Arduino has two different types of interrupts as well. The internal interrupts are used with the Arduino's internal timers. And external interrupts, which can be called pin change interrupts or external interrupts, are generated from external devices connected to the Arduino. Now the external interrupts we are talking about are generally generated by a change of state, which means when an item goes from a 0 to a 1 or a 1 to a 0. Now Arduinos have a couple of dedicated external interrupt pins. Now as to which pins are dedicated to interrupts depends upon which Arduino model you are using. On the Arduino Uno, pins 2 and 3 are used as interrupt pins. Internally, Arduino interrupts are labeled as interrupt 0, interrupt 1, etc, etc. On the Arduino Uno, pin 2 is mapped to interrupt 0, and pin 3 is mapped to interrupt 1. Now, as we saw in the earlier diagram, the interrupt service routine is special code that handles an interrupt. Now, an interrupt service routine needs to be very short and run very quickly so that you don't miss any additional interrupts. There are also a number of functions that will not work in an interrupt service routine. Functions dependent upon the timer. This includes things like the tone function and the servo function. All right, now we've discussed interrupts, let's actually put it into practice. I've got a little demo set up here on the workbench to show you. For this demonstration, I've placed two of the motors on the base along with their encoder disks. I've also placed the optical interrupter sensors onto the base as well. Now I'm powering the sensors with the 5 volts from the Arduino Uno, and I'm using my solderless breadboard simply to distribute the power to the two sensors. I've got the outputs of the sensors connected to the two hardware interrupt inputs on the UNO. So motor 1 is connected to pin number 2, which is interrupt 0, and motor 2 is connected to pin number 3, which is interrupt 1. I'm driving both of the motors directly with my 6-volt battery, and I've got two leads over here so I can independently turn the motors on or off. So this one will turn one of the motors off, and this one will turn the other motor on and off. So I can put them on independently or both at the same time. In this demonstration, I'm not making any attempt to control the speed of the motors. So now let's take a look at the Arduino sketch that we'll be running for this demonstration. So here's the sketch we're going to be using for our two motor demonstration. Our sketch requires a library called Timer1. The Timer1 library 
allows you to work with the internal timers in the Arduino. And this is very important for our sketch because the timers themselves create interrupts which would otherwise interfere with us. Timer 1 provides a very easy method of working with this and not interfering with the other interrupts. Now, if you don't have the Timer 1 library installed, or if you want to check to see if you do, just go up to Sketch and go into Include Library and then go to Manage Libraries. This will bring up the Arduino Library Manager. Once the Library Manager is loaded, filter a search by typing in Timer 1. And you will see the Timer 1 Library. Now in my case it is installed. If you don't have it installed, click the More Info link which will bring up a button over here that allows you to install the library. Now that we have the library installed, let's continue with our code. First we define a couple of constants that define where the motor sensors are connected. So motor 1 is connected to pin 2 and motor 2 is connected to pin 3. Now these are the interrupt 0 and interrupt 1 pins on the Arduino Uno that I'm using. If you're not using an Arduino Uno, these may be on two different pins as you saw in the chart I displayed earlier. So you will have to change these numbers accordingly. Next we'll define a couple of integers for the counters we'll be using to count the pulses, counter 1 and counter 2, and we initialize them with a value of 0. Next we have a float called disk slots, and this is simply the number of slots in our encoder disk. Now my disk has 20 slots in it, so I give it a value of 20.00. Notice the use of the decimal point because of the float. If you have a different number of slots on your disk, just change this number accordingly. Next, the interrupt service routines. As you recall, an interrupt service routine is the code that is run whenever an interrupt is received. And we actually have three of them because timer 1 also creates interrupts as well. The first interrupt service routine is for motor 1, and we're going to call this ISR count 1. And the only thing in this routine is we simply increment the counter by 1. So every time an interrupt is received, for, I, for motor 1, we'll increment its counter by 1. The same deal for motor number 2. Every time we get a pulse from the motor, we'll increment counter number 2. Now we go to the interrupt service routine for timer 1. And the first thing we do within it is we stop the timer and detach the interrupt. Now the reason we're doing this is because we're going to use a number of serial print statements within this interrupt service routine. And generally serial print statements aren't a good idea in an interrupt service routine because they take far too long and you could miss interrupts. But by stopping the timer we avoid that problem and we need the serial print so we can actually see what we are doing. So we're going to simply print motor speed 1, and then we're going to calculate the value of its rotation. I'll define a float called rotation 1, which is going to be equal to the number of counts that we have had within a second, divided by the number of slots on the disk. Now that'll give us the speed and rotations per second, but we want RPM, so we're going to multiply the whole result by 60. Again, notice the use of the decimal points because we're using floats. Then we're going to print that rotation value along with the word RPM after that, and then we are going to reset the counter back to zero. Now for motor number two, we are going to do precisely the same thing. After that, we will re-enable the timer by attaching the interrupt service routine to it. So we're actually attaching the routine that we're within right now, but that's perfectly valid. Now let's look at the setup. In our setup, we're going to start the serial monitor at 9600 baud. You can run it at a different speed if you wish. Then we're going to initialize timer 1. Now timer 1 can be initialized for a number of microseconds, millions of a second. We're going to use 1 million microseconds, which is 1 second. Now here's where we attach the interrupts service routines to the actual interrupts and we use the Arduino attach interrupt statement and this statement over here is really the heart of working with interrupts. 
Now the first part of it is which interrupt are we attaching? Now interrupt number zero is the first one we're attaching and we could just put the value zero here and that would work fine. But it is considered proper programming practice instead to use the statement digital pin to interrupt and then define the actual digital pin you're using. And the reason for doing this is we can then move this to other models of the Arduino other than the Uno. So again, you could replace this whole thing with a zero and it would work, but it is considered proper programming practice to do it this way. Next, we say which one of the interrupt service routines we're going to run when this interrupt happens. So in this case, it's motor one. We're going to run the routine we saw earlier, ISR underscore count one. And then when do we trigger the interrupt? There are a number of cases in which we can do it. This is rising. This means that whenever the line goes from a 0 to a 1, the interrupt will be triggered. There are a number of other parameters we could have used, but rising is what I chose to use over here. So every time that we get a rising pulse that goes from 0 to 1 on this line, it'll create an interrupt and it'll run this interrupt service routine. We have an identical statement for the next interrupt for motor number two, which will run ISR underscore count two. And then we also have to attach an interrupt to our timer. And you'll notice this is the very same statement we used at the end of the interrupt service routine for the timer, which simply attaches the ISR timer one uh, routine to the timer interrupts. After this, we have the loop, and for those of you who've done a lot of Arduino programming, you might be surprised by what you see in it. There's absolutely nothing in our loop, and I just put that there to illustrate that you could be running other code at the same time because the interrupts are handling everything over here. So now that we've seen the code, let's actually put it in action. All right, let's take a look at our code in action. I've opened my serial monitor and both motors are currently reading zero RPM, which makes perfect sense since neither motor is turning. I'm going to activate motor number one now. And as you can see, we're getting a reading from motor number one. Notice there's a slight time lag and that's because of the one second timer that we're using for counting. Turn that off, and now we'll put motor number two on. And once again, I'm getting a reading from motor number two. So let's try them both. And we're getting a reading from both motors. So as you can see, our speed sensors are working perfectly. So now that we've seen how our sensors work, it's almost time to put everything together onto our robot car base. However, in order to make that information and do something practical with it, such as calculating speed and distance, we need to know one other parameter, and that is simply the diameter of the wheel that we are using. Now, if you were fortunate, your robot car base may have come with a spec sheet that included the diameter of the wheel. I, however, was not that fortunate with either of those kits, but it's a simple matter to measure wheel diameter. So let's do that right now. I'll just take up my calipers and place them around the wheel. And I get almost 66, roughly 66 millimeters uh, is the diameter of the wheel that I'm using right now. And so knowing that, I can use that to calculate distance. In order to calculate distance, I need the circumference of the wheel. And the wheel circumference will indicate the distance the wheel will travel in one rotation. The circumference is the diameter multiplied by pi, which is roughly 3.14. Once I know the circumference of the wheel, I can also use that to calculate speed because speed is distance divided by time and I can use centimeters per second or inches per second which are practical units for a small robot car like this.
So now we have everything that we need to know to get our robot car up and running. All that remains really is to wire everything up and to write some code. So before I show you the schematic, I just want to show you a few things I did when I wired up my car just to help you out in wiring yours up. For one thing, I made a lot of use of this ribbon cable. This stuff is very, very useful. It comes in male to male, male to female, and female to female varieties. These are the male to female variety, and they're great for hooking up the sensors and also for hooking up the L298N. You just peel off the number of conductors that you need, and it's a quick way of making connection cables. I also made use of just regular 20 gauge hookup wire, and I've hooked up uh, the power from the Arduino to the little solderless breadboard, and I've used the breadboard basically this to distribute the, uh, the 5 volts from the Arduino to the uh, sensors, and also to the uh, L298N. Now, the L298N, remember there's a jumper on there that you need to remove in order to power it from the Arduino instead of powering it off of its own motor power supply. That's particularly important if you're only using a 6 volt supply because it wouldn't have enough voltage to power the logic circuitry on the L298N. Also, on this particular type of L298N module, there were a couple of little jumpers that were connected to the enable line. You have to remove those ones as well. So there were three jumpers to pull. Now, as you can see, I've got a 9-volt battery mounted underneath here, and I held it on with a couple of tie wraps. Now, of course, changing the battery is going to be a little more difficult because of that. I might have to remove and replace the tie wraps, but it holds it pretty securely, and I passed the tie wraps not sure if you can see that through the sides of the sensors you remember the holes I drilled in there so it's actually holding down the optical interrupter sensors and the battery at the same time I also use tie wraps over here on the motor wiring just to keep it from interfering with any of the moving parts you don't want anything to interfere with the wheels or the sensor wheels and so by doing this I kept everything out of the way um, I wired my uh, 9 volt battery supply and passed the wires under the Arduino here and I did that for the same reason so that when everything is connected it's not going to uh, hook it's not going to hit the wheel over here um, otherwise uh, I used hookup wire again to uh, run the connection from the L298N to the solderless breadboard, the jumper cables to run uh, the, the connections from the sensors up to the Arduino. And uh, you can test everything out uh, once you've done this, even before you write code. I'm going to plug it in, and you can see I've got some lights going on on the Arduino. You can also see as I spin these wheels, I get the lights flickering on the sensor devices and that pretty well lets me know that those are hooked up correctly plus the L298N also has a power to light that's hooked up that displays when the battery is hooked up so that's a pretty good indication that the wiring is correct so now that we've seen how I've laid out the wires here let's take a quick look at the schematic here are the components we'll be using for our robot, an Arduino Uno, an L298N H-Bridge motor driver, two speed sensors, along with the two motors and two batteries. We'll start by connecting the 5 volts and ground from the Arduino Uno to the VCC and ground connections on the two sensors. After that, we'll take the 5 volts and ground from the Arduino Uno and connect them to the L298N 5 volt input. Be sure to remove the jumper on the L298N to allow it to be powered by an external power source. After that, we'll take our battery, which could be 7.5 or 6 volts, and connect it to the L298N. Then we'll connect the 9 volt battery to the Arduino Uno. We'll wire motor A to the connections on the L298N, and then we'll wire motor B to the L298N. We'll take the output of sensor A and connect it to pin 3 of the Arduino Uno. The output of sensor B will then be connected to pin 2 of the Uno. We'll then connect the L298N to the Arduino Uno as follows. 
We'll connect the Enable A from the L298N to pin 10 of the Arduino Uno. Note that your L298N might have a jumper here which needs to be removed. Input 1 from the L298N will connect to pin 9 of the Uno. Input 2 will connect to pin 8. Input 3 will connect to pin 7. Input 4 will connect to pin 6. And finally, the Enable B line from the L298N will connect to pin 5 of the Arduino Uno. Again, your L298N may have a jumper that needs to be removed. And this completes the wiring. So here's the sketch we're going to be using with our robot car. Let's go over it. Now it starts off similar to the last sketch we used. We define two constants for motor A and motor B, and we assign them to the pins that our sensors are connected to. So motor A is connected to pin 3 on the Arduino Uno, which is interrupt 1, and that's the sensor for the right motor. Motor B is connected to pin number 2, and that is the sensor for interrupt 0, the left motor. After that, we define a constant called step count. It's a float, and it has a number of slots in our disk. Now, I've got 20 slots in my disk, so I define this as 20. If your disk has a different number of slots, you'll need to change this number to match. Similar for the next variable. It's another float called wheel diameter, which, of course, is the diameter of our wheel. This is in millimeters, in minus 66.1 millimeters. Again, if you have a different size wheel, just change this number to match. Then we do two integers for the pulse counters, as we did before. Counter A, and we initialize it to a value of 0, and counter B, which is also initialized to 0. Now, these are both integers, but they have one other statement in front of them called volatile. Now, volatile is a statement that we pass to the compiler in the Arduino IDE. And the reason we do this is that if the compiler looks at this code, it may see counter A and counter B are not used again in the code. And in that case, it might eliminate these variables to save some space in the code. Now, usually this is a good thing, but in the case of this particular code, it would cause the code not to work. So by giving it the statement volatile, we tell the compiler these variables will be used. Please reserve space for them. After that, we'll define our connections to the motor driver. So the enable A line goes to pin number 10, input 1 to 9, and input 2 to number 8. And that's for motor number A. For motor B, we've got enable B going to pin 5, input number 3 to pin 7, and an input number 4 to pin 6. Again, if you decide to use a different processor or different connections on your UNO, you can change these numbers. Just remember that these two enable lines have to be connected to a pin that's capable of pulse width modulation. Then we do the interrupt service routines, which were identical to the ones that we saw in our last sketch. So we've got ISR count A and ISR count B. And in each one of these interrupt service routines, we simply increment the counter every time that a pulse is received. Now I've got a function that converts centimeters to steps. You can give it the number of centimeters you want the car to travel, and it'll come back with the number of steps that the sensor needs to count to get there. So this function outputs an integer, so it's defined as an integer. Its name is cm to steps, and it takes one input, and it's a float called cm, or centimeters. Now, the way the function works is as follows. We define an integer called result. This will be the final result that we're going to pass back when the function is finished. Then we define a float called circumference. The circumference of the wheel, as you'll recall, is the wheel diameter multiplied by pi. We then divide that result by 10 because our wheel diameter is in millimeters and we want our results in centimeters and there are 10 millimeters per centimeter. After that, we define another float, which is the number of centimeters per step. So every step represents how many centimeters, and that's the circumference divided by the step count, which we defined earlier in this case as being 20. Then we'll get the result. Now, F underscore result is the floating result. We'll calculate the result by dividing the number of centimeters we've asked for by the cm per step value we've got over here. And this will return a float. 
Now we need to get an integer back, so we used what's called a cast statement. So our result is going to equal an integer of f result. Now one note I've put over here is that this is not rounded. Arduino's cast statement does not do any rounding. So if, for example, you get a result of 5.7, the result is going to be 5, not 6. Rounding, unfortunately, is something that the Arduino does not do natively. And although there are ways of doing it, I chose not to do it in this code simply because it will complicate things further. So now we've got our result as an integer. We just return the result, which sends the result back and exits the function. Okay, now we have a number of functions to move the car. I'm going to go through the first one, which is move forward. The other three are almost identical, only the direction of the motors is going to change. So we have a function called move forward. We start off with void because it doesn't give us back any result. Move forward takes two inputs, the number of steps we want to move forward and the speed of the motor, which is indicated by the variable m speed. They're both integers. And m speed can be equal to 0 to 255. Now, in this function, I haven't taken any steps to make sure that we don't pass a value below 0 or above 255. So you could make this function improved by adding code to do that. I just chose not to do it because it would just complicate things for this demonstration. So the first thing we do is we set our counters down to zero. Then we'll set the motors in the direction we want. And this is the only difference between the four functions that I have here, by the way. In this case, both of the motors are being set forward. So we just write the input one to high, input two to low, input three to high, and input four to low, which will set both motors going forward. Then after that, we're going to do a while loop, which will run while the motor is running and it'll count the steps. So here while the steps are less than counter A and the steps are less than counter B we will run this loop. Now the reason I use both counter A and counter B is because you may have noticed in our earlier demonstration the motors don't turn at exactly the same speed so it is possible especially on a long run for one motor to achieve the distance while the other motor is still catching up. Just, this makes sure the while loop runs while both of them are trying to catch up with the number of steps. So in the while loop, we say if the steps are less than counter A, the value of the number of steps we've asked for, then we'll do an analog write to enable A at the speed we've been asked to do. And if uh, the steps have exceeded that, we'll do an analog write of zero, which will stop the motor. And we do the exact same thing for motor number B. Now, once we're finished, we go and we stop the motors because it's quite possible that this else statement will never be issued. And if we don't do this, the motors will continue to run forever and ever. So again, we do analog writes to both motors to stop them. And then we reset the counter. Now, I have a function to move in reverse, which does exactly the same thing. And the only difference is we set the two motors into reverse. Another function to spin everything right. Again, the exact same thing, except I set motor A in reverse and motor B to go forward, and that will cause the car to spin in the right direction. And then finally, spin left, which is the opposite. We'll set motor A forward and motor B reverse. Otherwise, these functions are all identical. The while loop runs identically in the same way. Now we've done defined all of our functions, we're going to go into the setup routine. And we're going to run everything in the setup routine. Now, we attach the interrupts to their interrupt service routines identically to the way we did in the last sketch. We use digital pin to interrupt to define which interrupt we're getting. Again, we could replace this with a 1, and we could replace motor B with a 0, and that would work as well. But this is the proper way of doing it. And every time we get an interrupt on the motor A sensor, it's going to run the interrupt service routine called ISR underscore count A and an interrupt will be triggered on a rising pulse. The exact same thing for motor B and this is identical to what we did in the last sketch. And now we come to the part where we actually move the car. Now I've put this as you'll notice in the setup routine and that means this is going to happen just once and finish and you'll notice again there is nothing in the loop. 
Now if I'd taken all this code here and placed it in the loop instead, the car would continue to do this forever and ever and ever, but I just wanted to do all these sequences once and just stop. So here you can play around and randomly define sequences. So I've told the car to move forward at half a meter, which is 50 centimeters, at a top speed of 255. Then I put a delay, wait one second. I told it to move reverse, and this time instead of giving it centimeters, I've given it the number of steps, just to illustrate that you can do it either way. So now reverse 10 steps at 255, wait a second, move forward 10 steps at a slower speed, 150, wait a second, now reverse again, and this time I'm doing CN to steps, and I'm giving it a value of 25.4 centimeters. Now those of you who aren't familiar with the metric system, 25.4 centimeters is approximately one foot. And so it's going to reverse at 200 speed for about a foot. And then it's going to wait a second, and then I got it to spin right for 20 steps, and delay a second, spin left for 60 steps, delay a second, and then move forward by one step, and then stop. Now the reason I did the last one for one step was just to prove to myself that my logic was correct over here, when I went into all of these functions and on my while loop I gave it a greater than and not a greater than an equals sign and that proved out that it does indeed run for one count. If I given it an equal sign it would actually run for one extra step and be inaccurate. And so now that we've seen the code we can just upload that to our car and watch it in action. And so we finally come to the moment we've all been waiting for. The sketch is uploaded onto the car, and we're going to put it down on the floor and test it out. Now when I power up this car, of course, it's going to run its sketch, and I might not be ready to actually have it run. But since it's in the setup routine, it's only going to run once. So I'm going to let it run through, and then I can run it again anytime just by hitting the reset button on the Arduino. So I'll put the power on this. and it's going through its routine. And that last little one was that little one step that we had it do at the end. So now that it's ready, we'll put it down on the floor and hit the reset button and watch it go. Okay, I'm hunched down here on the floor with my car. I'm going to put it on the floor and hit the reset button and let it go. Press reset. Awesome! Car seems to work. Okay, so that about wraps it up. It's been a very long video, and if you've watched it to the end, I really appreciate it. But we have learned quite a bit. Not only have we learned how to assemble a little robot car base, we've learned how to use those little speed encoders, and we've learned about interrupts with the Arduino, and that's a very important programming technique that you can use with a number of your programs. Now, this little car base has a lot of potential, so I'm not going to take it apart. Instead, I'm going to make some more videos and add some more features onto this car. One feature that I've been asked for a lot is a remote control feature using either radio waves or Bluetooth. And so we're going to add a remote onto this car, and I'll show you how that is done. We'll also use the ultrasonic sensor that we used in a previous video in order to make a collision avoidance system. And I'm going to add line following capabilities to the robot car as well. So if you've built one of these along with me, please don't take it apart because there's more to come. Now, the best way to find out about these videos is to subscribe to the channel. So if you haven't done that already, please do that. I'd really appreciate it. And also, you will find all of the code in a detailed article about what we've done in this video on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. There's a link in the description below right to the article, so please check that out as well. Until then, take care of yourself, and I hope to see you soon again in the workshop. Bye for now.